Fair employment is when someone is employed at a level lower than their qualifications or skills. Overemployment, in contrast, is the employment of someone in a position that requires greater skills or knowledge than what the person has. Both of these conditions can be stressful and adversely impact on health. Additionally, poor work environments and higher risk jobs can make employment more problematic than beneficial. Lifestyle patterns largely develop during early adulthood with the development of social circles, employment and education and family, married or not, having children or not. Lifestyle patterns that develop during early adulthood, such as smoking, alcohol, and other drug consumption, religious or spiritual activity, physical activity, and dietary habits reveal their impacts in middle adulthood. Lifestyle in health psychology has largely been a concept relevant to individuals and research. An intervention in this area has largely focused on individual behavior change. However, lifestyle is inextricably linked with social conditions, economic circumstances such as employment, place of residence, and the larger community. Spirituality and well-being the massive growth in literature and research relating to spirituality and religion and their relevance to well-being and health is testament to the importance of these topics for contemporary health professionals. During adulthood, religious or spiritual development can change dramatically depending on many factors such as social groups that one is involved with, employment situations and major life events especially traumatic one. Additionally, beliefs and practices may change more than once. This is known as religious mobility or religious switching. For example, someone may become involved in a new church through the invitation of someone at work, but then, perhaps after moving to a new town, may find that their church attendance ceases, but they commence other activities, such as joining a social running group. Overall, research generally finds that religiosity or spirituality contribute to improved well-being and can contribute to health improvements and healing from illnesses. Although these benefits can change with religious switching, spirituality, while once and still often synonymous and used interchangeably with religion and organized religious practices, for example, Catholicism, Islamism and Buddhism, has become a field of study on its own, encompassing both secular and religious practices. In this sense, the definition proposed by Gomez and Fisher is apt. Spiritual well-being can be defined in terms of a state of being reflecting positive feelings, behaviors, and cognition of relationships with oneself, others, the transcendent, and nature, that in turn provide the individual with a sense of identity wholeness, satisfaction, joy, contentment, beauty, love, respect, positive attitudes, inner peace and harmony, and purpose and direction in life. Lacour and Vid describe these three domains of secular, spiritual, and existential orientations in terms of meaning-making in relation to health and illness. They consider the three domains in relation to knowing, Cognition, doing, practice, and being important, providing a useful tool to extract some of the complexities of these important topics. For example, using this framework, researchers can tease out some of the relationships between religion and health, such as the social supports often associated with some religious practices, for example, going to church, or the influence of medication or prayer activities on health. Given the importance of links between religion or spirituality and health, health professionals may find it very beneficial for clients to have their religious or spiritual needs considered, particularly in acute care or end-of-life contexts. For example, a recovering alcoholic undergoing inpatient cancer treatment may find it helpful for healthcare staff 
to assist with locating a local 12-step recovery meeting. 12-step recovery groups are based on spiritual principles and belief in a higher power to relieve one of their addictions. Health professionals may also recommend, when appropriate, that clients explore religion or spirituality as part of their healing processes. Demography In order to appreciate the importance of age and aging in healthcare practice, a look at the statistics and the demography of the population is essential. For example, different population groups have different age structures. This is shown in population pyramids, such as depicted in figure 3.5. Figure 3.5 illustrates the percentage of population in five-year age groups for the indigenous and non-indigenous population of Australia. We can deduce from this figure that the social issues for human development might vary considerably for indigenous and non-indigenous Australians. For example, while non-indigenous Australians have a greater proportion of people in the middle age groups, indigenous Australians have a greater proportion of the population represented in the younger age groups. The social impact of that is the greater demand on older indigenous Australians for childcare, compared with non-indigenous Australians, but greater demands on non-indigenous Australians for elderly care. These data illustrates the importance of a wide range of factors, in this case, population structure, when considering human development. Other demographic factors that are important to consider in healthcare include, for example, the populations living in urban, rural or remote areas and access to health services. It is also important to consider gender and place of birth and languages spoken as important considerations in healthcare. With an understanding of the demographics of the places where we live and work, we can potentially anticipate and prepare for ensuring that the health services we provide are appropriate and meeting the needs of the clients we see. Research focus. Ghana Minyarti. What is this? Development of cognitive questions for the Kimberley Indigenous Cognitive Assessment, Australasian Journal on Aging, 26. Abstract. Objectives. To describe the processes used to develop an instrument to assess cognition in the older indigenous community of the Kimberley region of Western Australia, given this diverse history and culture of the region. Methods Cognition questions were discussed with indigenous organizations, councils, linguistics, interpreters and health professionals. Existing assessment tools were reviewed. The cognition questions and the way in which they were approached were trialed with older indigenous participants. Results Questions to assess cognition were developed and incorporated into the Kimberley Indigenous Cognitive Assessment KICA, instrument, which has since been demonstrated to be a valid and reliable assessment of cognition in older indigenous Australians in the Kimberley. Conclusion the KICEA questions in the survey tool provide the first specific instrument for assessing cognitive decline in older indigenous Australians. This instrument or a modification of this instrument is likely to have broader applicability across indigenous communities in Northern Australia. Key points. In any study of indigenous people, it is important to consult with a range of community members and specialists to gain support and advice on how to develop appropriate questions for research instruments. Community studies of older indigenous people require awareness of historical, cultural and linguistic factors. Indigenous people are heterogeneous and there is a need to trial tools with people from different areas, language groups, ages and levels of cognitive impairment. The authors report that indigenous Australians are often not diagnosed 
with dementia until the dementia has progressed to late stages. While this may be due to complex factors such as language barriers, developing a dementia screening tool will assist in identifying dementia in early stages. The researchers included a consultation process as a part of their project and the project itself provided a useful tool for the people involved. Critical thinking Will the CAI-ACA tool be useful for other Aboriginal groups in Australia? Why or why not? What history of the Aboriginal people in the Kimberley may be relevant to understanding cognitive assessment with this group? Chronic illness and other health issues. Chronic illness, disability and other health issues increasingly become a part of reality as people age. Health psychology has also gained an increasing role in chronic and other illnesses because of the growing recognition of behavioral and social factors contributing to these conditions. For example, in 2010, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, and dementia and Alzheimer's disease were the top three underlying leading cause of death in Australia. With the aging population of Australia, it is perhaps not surprising that for the leading cause of death in Australia, dementia and Alzheimer's disease have gone from rank 8 in 1997 to rank 6 in 2001 to rank 4 in 2006 and in 2010 rank 3. Deaths from dementia and Alzheimer's disease have nearly doubled since 1997, from 3,294 in 1997 to 6,542 in 2006, and are more likely to affect women than men. For health professionals, these statistics suggest that illnesses are more common partly because people are living longer, but more importantly, as people age and certain illnesses become more prevalent, people will increasingly need care and specialized processes and equipment. For example, there has been an increase in the need of dialysis machine for kidney disease, stemming from diabetes. Therefore, not only are there a greater number of people with various illnesses, but also people are required to travel to assess specialized equipment and care, and their final years may be involved with hospitals rather than living close to their families. Death, dying, and bereavement. The topics of death, dying, and bereavement are often addressed in the context of older people, but obviously they can affect people of all ages. They are discussed here because death, dying, and bereavement become more likely as people grow older and therefore are a major part of human development for adults. Death, dying, and bereavement may affect people differently depending on many factors, such as the context of the death. For example, whether by an accident or after a long illness, the family and support situation available to both the person who dies and those who love, who have cared for them, and economic circumstances. Bereavement has been defined as the objective situation of a person who has suffered the loss of someone significant and grieving relates to the emotional experience of a bereavement. Perhaps the most well-known theory of stages of bereavement is Elizabeth kubler ross model, which suggests that people go through stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. While the model has been useful in helping people understand their emotional experiences during a time of bereavement, it has been argued that this theory has been taken too literally, is too simplistic, and has not necessarily been supported in the literature. The idea of stage bereavement can also contribute to professionals placing too much emphasis on the stages and then pathologizing people who do not go through the stages in the way a model, such as Kobler ross predicts. Some research has looked at applying ideas from stress and coping to understand grieving. A review by Strobet R of the health outcomes of bereavement suggested that there are a number of risk factors that increase vulnerability to problems with bereavement. Death of a spouse 
in terms of stressfulness of life events, ranks as the most stressful experience that people have. Grieving after someone dies is normal, and indeed, not grieving, especially if the death was of a close family member or friend, will be seen as problematic. Reactions to bereavement are generally classified according to affective, emotional, cognitive, thought-based, behavioral, physiologic, somatic, immunological, and endocrine changes. Overall, bereavement increases physical ill health and physical health complaints, as well as the incidence of seeking health care. Complicated grief, however, is when the psychological and social aspects of grieving exceed what might be considered normal. As with research on other topics relevant to health psychology, for example trauma and stress, it should not be surprising that research in bereavement is also exploring the positive aspects of grief and challenging previously held notions. For example, Schaeffer and Moose looked at positive growth, see also in literature on post-traumatic growth, following bereavement, and Heilman looked at the diversity of the grief experience, particularly the positive dimensions, following the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. Other research has explored the possibilities of creativity and art as therapy in bereavement. Chapter 11 also examines loss resulting from death, dying and bereavement. Research focus. Healthy aging in rural Australia. Issues and challenges. Australasian Journal on Aging 27 by Davis and Bartlett. Abstract. Approximately 36% of the rural Australian population is 65 years or older. In fact, many rural or remote communities have higher proportions of older people than metropolitan centres. The rate of growth, patterns of migration, higher levels of health risk factors and of social and economic disadvantage all impact on healthy ageing in rural communities. Older people in rural communities have become marginalized by long-standing misconceptions about rural life and urban-centric policies, much of which goes unchallenged because of a paucity of research in key areas and a lack of intra-rural research. Understanding the complexities of rural healthy aging is challenging and more research is required to develop a stronger empirical base. The aim of this review was to critic the literature related to rural aging in Australia to identify the issues and challenges for rural healthy aging and implications for policy and practice. Key point. Approximately 36 of the rural dwelling population in Australia is aged 65 or older. Rural living presents a range of challenges for optimizing healthy aging. Perceptions about rural aging are often inaccurate and do not reflect the diverse nature of the rural experience. More research into the differences between and within rural communities is needed to inform policy and practice to support healthy aging in rural areas. Critical thinking In Davis and Barlett's article, the authors discuss some of the health benefits of rural living, such as fresh air, peace and quiet, lower housing costs, and less violence and crime. The authors also discuss some of the things that make it harder to live healthily in rural settings. Some of these include the higher costs of food, fuel and transportation, and barrier to social activities and access to health services. How might knowledge of rural Australia contribute to your practice? Consider if you are working in an urban centre and have clients from rural or remote areas. What might you need to consider in your treatment? What issues might health professionals working in a rural or remote area need to consider? Consider access to equipment, specialists and options in emergency situations. Conclusion 
To summarize, this chapter explored various stage theories in adult developmental psychology, including Erickson, Kohlberg, Bronfan Briner, and Henry and Cloak. Developmental milestones such as marriage and employment were explored and the relevance of these to healthcare practice was discussed. All of these theories and ideas can be critiqued and exceptions made to the stages or theories. While stages and generalization about adulthood and aging can be made, it is important to consider different circumstances at different ages and how people of various ages in different situations might be affected. It is not possible to determine exactly how people will behave at different times of their lives. But learning how to identify differences and to expect these differences will improve the appropriateness of healthcare practice. For example, knowing that a client in your health clinic is 21 years old provides very different health expectation compared with knowing that a client is 50 or 80 years old. However, expectations and treatment will differ greatly for a single 21-year-old client who grew up in urban Australia compared with a 20-year-old client with three children and recently arrived from the Middle East. Theories about developmental stages of adulthood can provide a guide to understanding clients but cannot predict exactly the lived human experience. Developing an understanding of developmental stages is at least partly dependent on personal experience in addition to experience with others to understand the diversity of people's lives. With so much diversity, asking your clients about their contexts, circumstances, milestones and stages of life will go far in ensuring that the health care provided is appropriate and relevant. Remember, the lived experiences of adulthood are amazingly diverse in Australia and New Zealand relative to the socio-economic status, ethnicities, disabilities, genders, geographic locations, and types of religions and spiritualities. Understanding the diversity of adult lives can improve healthcare practice and outcomes. While developmental theories provide useful models for understanding human development, they are not always universally applicable. Chapter 4 Health and Health Psychology What is health? Health is a construct that can be defined in both broad and narrow terms. Narrow interpretations are provided by the biomedical model, which emphasizes the presence or absence of disease, pathogens, and or symptoms. A broader interpretation is provided by the biopsychosocial approach, that proposes that health is influenced by a complex interaction of biological, psychological, and social factors. See Table 4.1 for sociological, psychological, and biomedical factors that influence health. Additionally, health can be examined both objectively and subjectively. Objective measures, such as an X-ray or scan, can indicate health or illness while an individual subjective interpretation will report whether he or she feels healthy or ill, but there may be no correlation between the two. For example, a person may report feeling healthy, but have dangerously high blood pressure, or another person may report pain, for which physical pathology cannot be identified. Therefore, given the range of criteria, and the different perceptions that can influence a definition of health, it is not surprising that many interpretations exist and that debate surrounds an agreed definition of the concept. Furthermore, health can have different meanings for the general public or lay people than it does for health professionals. Three consistent themes arise in research into lay people's understanding of the concept of health. They are, health is not being ill, health is a prerequisite for life's functions, and health involves both physical and mental well-being. 
Baum suggests that these lay definitions have more in common with the World Health Organization's definitions of health more than the absence of disease than biomedical interpretations do. Biomedical model Throughout history, explanations for illness have included somatic imbalance, demonology, witchcraft, and environmental pathogens. In Western industrialized countries up until the middle of the 20th century, health was generally viewed as the absence of disease, and illness was seen as a pathological state. With the emergence of public health movement in the 19th century, the biomedical approach, also called the medical model, rose to prominence and dominated Western medicine for more than 200 years. The biomedical model proposes organic, pathological theories to explain and treat illness. Essentially, this approach is an illness-based model with underpinning assumption that illness and disease are caused by disequilibrium in the body that is brought about by one or more of the following. Biological pathogens such as viral or bacterial infection, trauma or injuries such as acquired brain injury, biochemical imbalance in the body such as hypothyroidism or diabetes, degenerative processes such as arthritis or dementia. From the 19th century, public health strategies utilizing a biomedical approach such as mass vaccinations and sanitation have achieved a worldwide reduction in many communicable diseases like polio, smallpox and pneumonia and an increase in life expectancy. In the 20th century, the discovery of antibiotics psychotropic medications and the development of sophisticated surgical techniques such as organ transplantation have enabled previous life-threatening diseases and conditions to be treated and in many cases cured. However, by the latter half of the 20th century, it became apparent that the treatment era of the previous decades did not live up to the expectations of the scientific or wider community. In Western countries, for example, diseases related to lifestyle, like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, now pose a greater threat to health than that of infectious diseases. Also with regard to the treatment of infectious diseases, some bacterial strains have developed resistance to antibiotics. And for many cancer, neither a cure or preventive vaccination has, has been discovered. Many cancer prevention and chronic illness management strategies are related to lifestyle and the environment, such as seizing cigarette smoking, using sun protection, being physically active, eating a healthy diet, and maintaining weight within the healthy range. In the mental illness field, the unwanted side effects of antipsychotic drugs are often problematic and can contribute to non-adherence to treatment for example, the rapid and sustained weight gain and iatrogenic diabetes mellitus experienced by some patients taking a typical antipsychotic medication to treat schizophrenia. Such consequences of treatment present a challenge to both patients and health professionals with regard to the relative cost benefits of the treatment, to the relative cost benefit of the treatment. For patients, the unwanted social and health consequences may interfere with adherence to the recommended treatment. For health professionals, there is, an eth there is the ethical dile dilemma of encouraging adherence to a treatment for one health condition, such as schizophrenia that carries a high risk that the patient will develop another serious health condition, such as diabetes mellitus. Challenges to an exclusive biomedical approach Initially, the biomedical model held great promise to improve the health of individuals and communities. Scientific research in the 20th century led to the discovery of medications that could cure or eliminate many diseases, sulfur drugs developed in the 1930s, and other antibiotics revolutionized the treatment of infection. In the mental health field, the first antipsychotic medication, chlorpromazine, was introduced in 1950. At the time, 
It was lauded as a breakthrough in the treatment of schizophrenia because of its ability to reduce disruptive behavior. Patients would have been straight jackets and lived out their lives in a mental institution could now be discharged and returned to live in the community. However, by the middle of the 20th century, concerns were mounting regarding the cause escalation of scientific technological medicine worldwide there was recognition of need for sustainable environments. It was also evident, particularly in Western countries, that the disease that threatened communities were no longer infectious and acute, but were chronic and related to lifestyle. For example, the health conditions that now carry the greatest burden of disease are mental illness, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, substance abuse, and interpersonal violence. Challenges to the biomedical model as the exclusive framework for understanding health and to structure the delivery of healthcare services began to emerge from the middle of the 20th century, the major criticism being that an exclusive biomedical approach fails to take into account the contribution of a broader psychological, sociological, political, economic, and environmental factors that influence health and illness. A further criticism of an exclusive biomedical approach is that health resources are directed to costly curative services rather than to health promotion or illness prevention. Baum argues that there needs to be more research on the ways in which social and economic factors affect health and what social, educational, housing and health interventions most improve health and health equity. Questioning of the dominance of the biomedical model by policymakers, commentators and clinicians coincided with the United Nations establishing World Health Organization in the 1940s. World Health Organization was given the brief to work towards the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. And in 1946, the organization released its then groundbreaking definition of health that stated, Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely by the absence of disease or infirmity. This definition was developed in response to the change in health care needs of populations. The World Health Organization explanation contested the efficacy of the prevailing biomedical view of health at the time by recognizing the contribution of not only physical factors to health and illness, but social and psychological factors as well. World Health Organization's broadening of the definition of health signaled the introduction of what became known as the biopsychosocial approach, in which the contribution of individual lifestyle and social factors to health outcomes is acknowledged. It also laid the foundation for the emergence in the 1970s of the primary health care, new public health movement. Nevertheless, while the World Health Organization definition of health is a comprehensive one, it has its limitations. The use of word complete is problematic. Is it possible to be completely healthy in all areas identified physical, mental and social and at all times? And if this is not possible, does it necessarily follow that an individual who has one health issue is unhealthy? Consider, for example, a person with a well-managed chronic illness, asthma for example, or a disability, vision impairment, who is otherwise in good health. If you ask either of these two individuals to rate their health, do you think they will describe themselves as unhealthy? They probably will not. When asthma is managed by medication and vision impairment corrected by glasses, the person does not experience limitations from the health issue. Therefore, in seeking a comprehensive definition of health, other factors must be considered, including the individual's sense of control of and satisfaction with his or her health and life. Furthermore, there are demonstrated links between income and health outcomes, that is, that poor people have worse health outcomes regarding morbidity and mortality than people who are wealthy. 
This occurs both within and between countries. For example, in a Finnish study, Tarkainen et al. In a Finnish study, Tarkainen et al. 2011 found a gap in life expectancy of 5.1 years for men and 2.9 years for women between people in the lowest and highest income groups. And while life expectancy in New Zealand is 79 years, it is only 39 years in Angola. World Health Organization recognizes the importance of addressing income inequities to improve health and stated in the Closing the Gap report that higher levels of better coordinated aid and debt relief apply to poverty reduction through a social determinants of health framework are a matter both of life and death and of global justice. Increased longevity over the past two centuries in Western countries is attributed not only to advances in medical treatments, but also to public health initiatives and population level interventions, such as access to safe water and sanitation. Programs to address global road safety, tobacco control and vaccination programs for preventable diseases. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 2011. In fact, the biggest increase in life expectancy that occurred in the first half of the 20th century is attributed mainly to public health initiatives and population-focused interventions, not advances in medical science. Yet, in 2007 and 2008, the Australian government spent only 21.6% if its $100 billion health budget on public health activities for whole populations or population groups. This means that almost 80% of the government's health budget was allocated to treatment interventions and services for illness and injury. Yet the evidence suggests that this is not the most effective allocation for financial resources to achieve the best health outcomes for individuals and populations. In summary, the biomedical model holds the view that health outcomes are influenced by physiology, with health occurring when the body is in a state of equilibrium and illness being a consequence of physical pathology or disequilibrium. The approach is limited as a theory to explain and understand health and the provision of healthcare services because it is a one-dimensional model that fails to take into account the complex interplay of other factors, namely psychological and social factors that interacts with biological factors and affect health. Biopsychosocial model. As discussed, the philosophy that underpins the biopsychosocial model is that health or illness results from a complex interplay between biological, psychological, and social factors. The model emerged in the 1970s in response to realization regarding the limitation of biomedical model in a changing world. The notion of an alternative to biomedical model was first proposed by Engel in 1997 and quickly gained momentum among health professionals and policymakers. The biopsychosocial model is holistic in approach and thereby avoids the mind-body split inherent in the biomedical model. A further outcome of this approach is the recognition of the contribution made by allied health professionals to healthcare and the emergence of multidisciplinary team as a mechanism for providing health services. Health priorities. Australia's national health priority areas are health issues identified by the Federal Department of Health and aging for focused attention because they contribute significantly to the burden of illness and injury in Australia. The eight priorities areas are cancer control, injury prevention and control, cardiovascular health, diabetes mellitus, mental health, asthma, arthritis, musculoskeletal conditions, obesity, all of which have complex ideology, including lifestyle, biological, psychological, and social factors. In addressing these health problems, the holistic nature of the biopsychosocial model offers greater opportunity 
to improve health outcomes than a biomedical approach alone, because the biopsychosocial approach addresses more than just the symptoms of the condition. Nevertheless, despite the intrinsic appeal of the biopsychosocial model, some critics argue that, generally, social issues are not sufficiently addressed in practice. Utilizing another approach, primary health care, new public health that operates from a biopsychosocial framework and has a strong emphasis on social and political issues that impact on health, is proposed as a way to overcome this shortcoming. Primary health care, new public health, the emergence of the primary health care, new public health movement, also in the 1970s, coincided with the growing awareness that psychological and social influences, as well as physical and biological factors, influence health outcomes for individuals and communities. It was formally endorsed as a mechanism to achieve health for all by years 2000 at the 1978 World Health Organization conference in the Declaration of Almaty in the former Soviet Union. The declaration was the culmination of a World Health Organization UNICEF-sponsored conference at which representatives from 134 nations endorsed the declarations with the philosophical principles of social justice, equity, access, empowerment, self-determination, political action, health promotion and illness prevention, collaboration between consumers, practitioners, countries, governments and those responsible for health and striving for world peace. Worldwide policymakers, health professionals and communities were increasingly looking beyond the biomedical model for answers to health problems. In 1981, Lalonde, the then Canadian Minister of National Health and Welfare, described four general determinants of health that he called human biology, environment, lifestyle and healthcare organization, supporting a shift from a biomedical approach to a broader approach acknowledging biopsychosocial factors, Lalonde stated, There can be no doubt that the traditional view of equating the level of health in Canada with the availability of physicians and hospitals is inadequate. Marvelous through healthcare services are in Canada in comparison with many other countries. There is little doubt that further improvements in the level of health of Canadians lie mainly in improving the environment, moderating self-imposed risks and adding to our knowledge of human biology. In 1986, eight years after the Alma Atta Declaration, the first World Health Organization International Conference on Health Promotion was held in Ottawa, Canada. Conference participants developed an action framework on five strategies, the Ottawa Charter, to achieve health for all. These five strategies have become the cornerstone of primary health care, new public health movement, and the Charter continues to be a robust, insightful and useful document in contemporary healthcare policy and practice. Nevertheless, some commentators argue that health policy alone is insufficient to achieve health equity and social justice and that a health in all policies, for example education, welfare, housing, approach is needed to address health inequities. Table 4.2 Actions of the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion Ottawa Charter Strategy Number 1. Build healthy public policy, whose action is to direct policymakers to be aware of the health consequences of their decisions and to develop socially responsible policy. Number 2. Create supportive environments whose action is to generate living and working conditions that are safe, stimulating and satisfying and enjoyable. Number 3. Strengthen community action, whose action is to empower communities and enable ownership and control of their own endeavors and destinies. Number 4. To develop personal skills, whose action is to support personal and social development 
through providing information, education for health, and enhancing life skills. Number five, reorient health services whose action is to share responsibility for health promotion in health services among individuals, community groups, health professionals, health service institutions and government. Health of Australians and New Zealanders When compared with other countries in the world, the health of Australians and New Zealanders ranks highly. They are rated among the top 10 developed countries in the world across a range of significant indicators. Life expectancy is ranked among that of the top nations in the world. See Table 4.3 for life expectancy for selected countries. In addition, Australians born in the 21st century can be expected to live 20 to 25 years longer than their ancestors born at the commencement of the 20th century. That is, a male born in 1901 had life expectancy of 55.2 years, whereas a male born in 2008 has life expectancy of 79.2 years. Classroom activity. Examine the international life expectancy statistics in Table 4.3. What do these statistics tell us? What are the implications of this? Number two, before coming to class, select three countries, each with a short, medium and long life expectancy, and research the health issues in these three countries. Identify the health priorities or significant health issues of the three countries. Discuss and critique these health issues and priorities in class. Identify biomedical, psychological and sociological contributors to these health issues. Life expectancy in selected countries Japan 82.25 Hong Kong 82.14 Singapore 82.04 Australia 81.81 Indigenous Australians 70 South Korea 79.05 United Kingdom 80.05 New Zealand 79 Maori 70.4 United States 78.37 China 74.68 Indonesia 71.33 Papua New Guinea 66.24 India 66.8 Angola 38.76 21st century health challenges Regardless of the gain made in longevity over the past 100 years in Australia and New Zealand, there are some disturbing trends in the health statistics of these two nations. Life expectancy for Indigenous Australians is 11.8 years lower than the national average. While this gap has reduced from 17.5 years in 2005 2007, the AIHW cautions that the decrease is more likely to be as a consequence of a change in how the Australian Bureau of Statistics ABS, collects statistics rather than an actual increase in the indigenous life expectancy. Also, while the discrepancy is not as great in New Zealand as it is in Australia, Maori life expectancy is 8.6 years less than the New Zealand average. Furthermore, Indigenous Australians are not only die younger than the national average, they also experience significantly more ill health and disability than other Australians. Also of concern is cardiovascular disease, which in Australia is the leading cause of death, 36% of death, and one of the leading causes of disability, 6.9% of the population. And while mortality figures for most health conditions, including coronary heart disease, stroke, colon cancer, and infant mortality, have improved over the past 25 years in Australia, the mortality figures have worsened for some other illnesses, such as diabetes mellitus, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and accidental falls. Finally, Australia has the unenviable honour 
of being ranked in the worst third of OECD countries for obesity levels, measured by a body mass index greater than 30. That puts the Australians at increased risk for lifestyle health conditions, such as high cholesterol, hypertension, heart disease and some cancers. Framework for Health In conclusion, finding a universally applicable definition of health is challenging because health is a dynamic concept influenced by a complex range of factors that interact with and influence each other. Therefore, rather than pursuing an all-encompassing definition of health, a more useful approach is to utilize a framework for understanding health, such as the one developed by the AIHW in 2012 that identifies individual, societal, and environmental influences on health and the interrelationship between these factors. What is health psychology? Health psychology emerged as a branch of psychology in the 1970s during the emergence of biopsychosocial model and the primary healthcare new public health movement. Influential in the development of health psychology was the change in health needs of populations mounting dissatisfaction with the biomedical model and concerns regarding the escalating cost of a medically oriented healthcare system alongside the growing realization of the role psychological, social and lifestyle factors play in health and illness. Additionally, chronic illnesses were replacing acute illnesses as posing the greatest burden of disease to individuals, communities, and healthcare resources. The prevailing view at this time was that individuals were primarily responsible for their own health and that health outcomes were a consequence of individuals' lifestyle choices. In 1980, Matarazzo provided a definition of health psychology that stated that health psychology was an aggregate of the specific educational, scientific, and professional contribution of the discipline of psychology to the promotion and the maintenance of health, the prevention and treatment of illness, the identification of etiologic and diagnostic correlates of health, illness and related dysfunction, and the improvement of healthcare system and health policy information. This definition specified the scope of health psychology that was to study psychological aspects of how people engage in behaviors that maintain health and minimizes health risks. Study how thoughts, feelings, and personal qualities influence health behaviors and lifestyle choices. Study how thoughts, feelings and personal qualities influence responses to stress, pain, loss and chronic illness, to study how people recognize and respond to illness and how they decide to seek, start and complete treatment or not, identify health promotion and illness prevention strategies and early intervention opportunities. Contemporary critical health psychologists, however, question the moral and ethical stance of the psychological approaches to health that emerged in the 1970s and 1980s that blamed individuals for their health behaviors such as smoking or eating unhealthy food. In the 21st century, there is no abundant evidence that social determinants play a major role in health outcomes. Hence, contemporary critical health psychologists place increasing importance on the context in which individuals live their lives and advise that social, political, and economic forces must be taken into consideration when exploring explanations of health behaviors. As Murray observes, health psychology is not the steady accumulation of knowledge, but rather a process of inquiry and an action that is socially immersed. In summary, Health psychology seeks understanding for human health behaviors within the psychosocial, economic and political contexts in which people live in order to identify ways of maintaining positive health behaviors, identify strategies to assist people to avoid or modify negative health behaviors, and assist people to maintain new health behaviors. This not only enables individuals to achieve, maintain, 
or improve health, but it is important for wider society in that it can improve the health of its citizens and reduce the human and resource cost of illness. Health Psychology as a Career Health psychology is a specialized branch of psychology and has to career pathways, theoretical research or applied clinical practice. Research psychologists develop and test theories and evaluate interventions, while clinical psychologists work in range of healthcare settings as members of multidisciplinary teams. Entry to both of these career pathways requires a specialist postgraduate qualification in psychology. According to the Australian Psychological Society, health psychologists specialize in understanding the relationship between psychological factors such as behaviors, attitudes, belief, and health and illness. Health psychologists practice in two main areas, health promotion, which is prevention of illness and promotion of healthy lifestyles, and clinical health, which is the application of psychology to illness assessment, treatment, and rehabilitation. Health psychology for health professionals. Moreover, health psychology makes a contribution to the education and practice of all health professionals. Theory and research from health psychology is a fundamental component in courses that prepare practitioners for all the healthcare professions, including, but not limited to, nursing, nutrition, medicine, occupational, therapy, social work, speech pathology, paramedic practice, and physiotherapy. Health professionals use knowledge and research findings from health psychology to understand the health behaviors of their patients and to plan treatment interventions, rehabilitation and recovery programs, illness prevention and health promotion programs. Understanding health behaviors. Behaviors that promote health have long been known. For example, in 1983, Berkman and Brislow identified seven health practices that their research demonstrated could significantly reduce an individual's risk of dying at any age. They are sleeping 7-8 to eight hours per day, eating breakfast, rarely eating between meals, being roughly appropriate weight for height, not smoking, drinking alcohol in moderation or not at all, engaging in physical activity regularly. These practices continue to be relevant in the 21st century. In 2010, the AIHW cited tobacco smoking, physical inactivity, alcohol misuse, illicit drug use, poor nutrition, and unsafe sex as behavioral determinants of health, which contribute significantly to disease burden in Australia. Critical thinking. Keep a diary for a week in which you record whether or not you observe the health behaviors identified by Berkman and Brislow. Identify your reasons for following or not following these identified health behaviors. Influences on health behaviors. Psychological approaches to understanding health include examination of personality factors, perceptions and belief about personal control and individual, and environmental factors that reinforce behaviors. These will not be considered. Personality. The psychological theories of personality that have particular relevance to the field of health psychology are the behavioral and cognitive models. Behavioral psychologists stress the role of learning, reinforcement and modeling in the initiation and maintenance of behaviors while cognitivists argue that behaviors are influenced by the individual's belief and perception about themselves, events or circumstances. Additionally, personality traits and dispositions that are predictive of behavior have been identified. Personality types The first description of a personality style that was purported to influence health was the type A personality type, which was described by two American cardiologists, 
who observed personality characteristics in their patients that they believed predisposed these patients to the risk of cardiovascular disease. In individuals with type A personality were considered to be competitive, impatient, time conscious, hostile, unable to relax and had rapid loud speech. Type B individuals were described as relaxed, quieter and less hurried than type A individuals. While this categorization have intuitive appeal, it appears that the distinctions are not predictive of risk for coronary heart disease. For example, research conducted by Mitashvili and Danila examine the relationship between a range of psychological factors and coronary heart disease CHD, and fail to find a significant relationship between CHD and personality. The researchers did find, however, that low socioeconomic status CES, and job were associated with an increased risk of acute coronary events. This is similar to the finding of the landmark Whitehall study of the British Civil Service that found that workers in lower level position with low job control experienced greater stress and had higher risk of CHD than higher level workers. See also chapter 10. Nevertheless, interest has been reignited recently in researching personality as a risk factor in the long-term prognosis of cardiac patients. With the introduction of the distress personality type or type T, Denole Pedersen described individuals simultaneously experience high levels of negative affectivity of or mood, NA, and high levels of social inhibition, SA. What this means is that when people with type T personality experience negative emotions, they inhibit the expression of these emotions in social interactions. Chida and Steptoe undertook a meta-analysis review of 44 studies and concluded that anger and hostility were associated with CHD outcomes in both healthy populations and those with CHD with the effect being greater in men than women. Demolay's research suggests it is not just the presence of negative emotions that may pose a risk factors that may pose a risk factor for cardiac disease, but also how that person copes with his or her negative emotions. This notion is further supported by research conducted by Williams et al. as demonstrated in the following research focus. Research focus. Type T personality mechanisms of effect. The role of health-related behavior and social support. Journal of Psychosomatic. Research 64 by Williams L. Abstract. Objective of type T personality, the conjoint effects of negative affectivity and social inhibition in a healthy British and Irish population. 2. To test the influence of type T on health-related behavior. And 3. To determine if these relationships are explained by neuroticism. Methods. A cross-sectional design was employed with 1,012 healthy young adults, 225 males, 787 females, mean age 20.5 years from United Kingdom and Ireland completing measures of type T personality, health behaviors, social support, and neuroticism. Results The prevalence of type T was found to be 38.5%, significantly higher than reported in other European countries. In addition, type T individuals reported performing significantly fewer health-related behaviors and lower levels of social support than non-type T individuals. These relationships remain significant after controlling or neuroticism. Conclusion These findings provide new evidence on type T and suggest a role for health-related behavior in explaining the link between type T and poor clinical prognosis in cardiac patients.